Hi, I'm Dan Nexon. Hi, and uh, I'm Yuval Weber. And welcome to this edition of Foreign Entanglements, my first time on this side of the screen, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start uh, by uh, having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I feel honored to be uh, part of the maiden voyage here. Um, so uh, my name is Yuval Weber. I'm currently a visiting assistant professor at the Department on Government at Harvard University and a Catherine W. and Shelby Cullum Davis uh, Research Fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Uh, I'm on leave from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, uh, where prior to moving to Harvard, I spent about three, four years. Uh, I got to Moscow the first time in the very end of 2011, beginning of 2012, which provides a neat symmetry because literally the day that I got there, uh, or the day after that I got there, was the mass Bolotnaya protests. And over the past week, we have been talking a lot about uh, these protests. And so one of the great things about sort of actually being a political scientist in Moscow is that I was one of only two American IR people, like people who do IR in the country of Russia. Uh, and so it was really sort of an interesting experience seeing how power hangs together and seeing how um, President Putin and the people around him have these sort of very basic grand strategy goals, foreign policy goals, and how they cycle through actual, uh, you know, tactical ways to, to achieve them. Uh, but they've been here for about a year. So I, I asked you to come uh, on the program because we were both on a roundtable uh, jointly sponsored by Columbia University and New York University on uh, the future of U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed and got a lot out of your presentation, uh, particularly your efforts to contextualize uh, Russian activities surrounding uh, the most recent election, uh, sure. uh, Russian interference uh, in the American election. Uh, so I thought uh, we a bunch of the stuff you mentioned is things that we sure. should get to, uh, but I thought maybe we could start out with you telling a little bit, telling us a little bit about sort of what's your sense of what Moscow wants and what their objectives were uh, in. Uh, using uh, some amount of information warfare, as the term goes, uh, to try sure. to influence the U.S. election? So I think the most important thing to recognize is the U.S. election in and of itself is obviously important to Americans in the world in you know, one very specific sense. But to uh, Putin and the Russians, this is just part of an ongoing larger thing. The big thing of what Russia wants, like when we get down to it, is to be a great power, sort of a very broad goal, but however they figure it out, that's what they're moving towards. So in a sense, to interfere in the, in the, the U.S. election, uh, I was in Moscow for most of the summer ahead of the actual election. There was no, there was no thought that this was going to uh, result in the election of Donald Trump. Uh, the clear belief you know, amongst, like, let's say, my, my colleagues and just people in the foreign policy community is that, well, clearly WikiLeaks is sort of a Russian agent. Either it's direct or indirect, but... Clearly, they're in cahoots um, at, at minimum. And the idea was that if there is going to be sort of this entry into the U.S. election, it'll do two things. First, it'll, like what we've seen in Europe over the past couple elections and the forthcoming elections, it'll just destroy social cohesion. If, if you've ever been in an online fight or people uh, yelling at each other in a bar, that works. Uh, ruining social unity. So that's an important uh, sort of objective. And the second objective was uh, to get Hillary Clinton when she go when she actually wins, and this was the thinking. It was a surprise in Moscow as well as in uh, the U.S. Uh, that when she actually becomes the president, she's so hamstrung by all these domestic difficulties that all the foreign policy positions that they anticipate that she'll have, that she'll be, uh, you know, continuing the status quo and sanctions, will increase lethal assistance uh, to the Ukrainians in their fight against the the rebels in Ukraine, uh, in the east part of their country, uh, will take a tougher line on Syria. These are all the things that Russia has clear policy differences with Hillary Clinton, or at least the Hillary Clinton they thought was going to be president. So if they thought, so what the thinking was, we'll just get her weak, hamstrung, so that she's so, you know, bogged down like Gulliver and the Lilliputians in Washington that she won't essentially cast her ire uh, upon us. Before we move on to the the shift to maybe thinking that Trump victory was possible and what that might sure. entail, uh, I want to ask you a bit about that because, you know, from an American perspective, 
this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? In this, sure. you know, if we if you bog down, if you hurt Clinton's ability to get things done domestically, it would mm -hmm. seem that like a lot of presidents, she would become more active on the international stage. So, what is sure. the sort of thinking behind the idea that? having a bunch of investigations or having a narrow victory by Clinton would somehow make it more difficult or interfere mm -hmm. with her ability to take a harder line stance on Russia. So this is, um, I think one of the other great things uh, that I've experienced living outside the United States is, one, people believe that the politics of other countries are effect effectively reflections upon themselves. That it's just a different version of us. Second, in Russia, this, there is no doubt that you know, we ourselves are a great power. And so if we can get her to be essentially bogged down, that we at that point can come in with maybe some foreign policy overtures. Um, because we, are, of course, you know, hold the key to uh, all international politics. So their belief was if she's bogged down domestically, she won't have the energy or the space to essentially open uh, new fronts in conflict. That's not how, let's say, you and I as Americans would think, uh, or in terms of like, you know, like a wag the dog scenario, but that is the thinking. We are important, like we as Russians are important. We hold the key to all these foreign policy difficulties. Uh, she is bogged down by all these domestic troubles and her domestic opponents. We will come in with these deals, essentially to alleviate her burden in terms of providing foreign policy victories, thus allowing her to focus on her domestic issues. That's the thinking. Okay. Um, so part of it, as you've mentioned, was the idea of, of weakening Clinton in order yeah. to get more running room for Russian interests in foreign policy, right? Sure. Or international affairs. Um, another thing that um, you've touched on, and I think we've seen this kind of in the, we've seen this in sort of, you know, a lot of the writings about um, about uh, Russian motivations how, is the attempt to discredit U.S. institutions or to undermine U.S. Yeah. US democratic institutions. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? So, sure. So, um, the, the two big things, and, and, and again, the United States is just sort of like uh, a wider front in this sort of liberal, anti-liberal uh, cleavage. Um, to make democracy itself look bad for Americans or for Europeans that essentially by having these sort of really fundamental, you know, uh, debates about, you know, what should our country look like? What is our position in the world? Having those really difficult things within the United States um, and in Europe. And I should say what the Russians have been very good in terms of sort of this, you know, information warfare, what have you, is figuring out what are the actual issues important per country. So in Europe, if we had this conversation and we too were, Germans or French. If we were Germans, this, this whole conversation is about Syria. If this, um, if we're both, uh, so if we're German, it's about Syria. If we're French, it's about Islam in general. And here, the underlying issue was uh, economic recovery hasn't been good enough. Therefore, we're talking about Mrs. Clinton's corruption and sort of that and making that part of the issue. And the documents they released were all part of that narrative. But in all of these, domestically, they want to make democracy bad so that people are angry with each other. They also want to demonstrate to the Russian domestic audience, you know, we may not have the best elections, we may not have the most open governance, but wouldn't you prefer stability versus the bedlam that you're observing on TV like literally every single day? And so by essentially cutting to the very heart of what makes, let's say, America, let's say, actually great or the liberal order liberal, they cast a sort of aspersion on the order itself. If the underlying countries are not uh, essentially behaving well or doing right by their citizens, well, how can we trust the institutions which help govern sort of the international uh, institutional architecture? And so that's essentially the process. Make things bad on the domestic level, and from there, let everyone else's imagination do the work. So there are sort of two non-exclusive interpretations of, of one of the things that you've said, right? Yeah. One is that Russia's really out to, as a maximal goal, take down the liberal order. Um, uh, views it, you know, that, that Moscow views the liberal order as unfavorable as mm -hmm. to its interests, as giving a, 
is essentially a form of institutionalized power for the United States, for Western mm -hmm. European countries, uh, for other potential adversaries or rivals. Um, and the other, though, is sees this as sort of a more defensive move, right? Something that mm -hmm. comes, it, sort of a something that comes out of the Keller revolutions, out of democracy promotion by the United States and others, civil society building, and is primarily, you know, the liberal order could be okay if it weren't actively threatening domestic stability um, sure. or a, a sort of constant threat to domestic stability, even though the Russians have been pretty good at kicking out NGOs and things like that. How do you see those two things? Are they, are they at all separable? Mm -hmm. So I think this is, like, if I had a fundamental thing of what I think the bulk of Russian analysis gets wrong, is to say, like, th those are both, like, logically consistent interpretations. But to hold them as being opposed to each other, I think, is like where Russian analysis really gets it wrong. And I, and I say this, you know, with all, all due humility, but living in Russia for a number of years and essentially living through the life cycle of several crises and seeing how power hangs together, both of those things essentially become fused over time as leaders stay in power for a longer and longer time. So that the first thing that you said, maximal goal, Russia wants to bring down the liberal order. From the beginning of President Putin's time, and President Putin is just the latest in a very long line, you know, since Peter the Great, who have had to deal with the exact same political system. Bringing down the liberal order is not essentially a goal in and of itself. It's to make Russia a great power within the international order. If that requires bringing down the liberal order and making something new, well, that's it. But that's not essentially a necessary goal. So the big picture stuff, make Russia a great power. And their definition of a great power is it's a state that, you know, has a seat at the table. It can make the rules of international political and economic interaction or carve out exceptions for itself. That's a sine qua non of what they want. Over time, you know, events happen. And so for essentially a epochal sort of order shift, that takes years, if not decades. Well, who better to do it than the f person who came up with the idea? So that over time, President Putin needs to stay in power. First under, you know, he was reelected. So he came in in 2000, 2000 uh, elected first time, elected 2004, put in his assistant 2008 to 2012, the Medvedev, who is the subject of the recent protests. Um, they changed the constitution in order to extend the term by six years. So from 2012, 2018, 2018 to 2024, and then we can start to see the big picture, grand strategy, like we need to make Russia a great power. And so that every challenge to this, whether it comes from outside the country or inside the country, is in fact also defensive. And that's essentially like where these two things come together. Mm -hmm. President Putin has been very successful about making opposition to him, opposition to Russia. So in a sense, you cannot... Uh, you know, by the by the way that the president talks, by the way they make policy, distinguish between desire for democratic change and wanting to make Russia a permanent second-rate power. And that's the congruence that um, the president and his people are against. Do you think there was an inflection point? Um, you know, some people talk about uh, in the Bush administration early on. Some people talk about the the last round of NATO expansion. Some mm -hmm. people talk about. Um, the Keller revolutions themselves, sure. but you know, was there, was there an inflection point where um, Putin uh, and the then the current regime made a decision that they couldn't be accommodated in the liberal order, mm -hmm. that the liberal order threatened domestic stability, uh, and that so therefore the existence of U.S. liberal hegemony became something like an existential threat, or is this something sure. that so in, which implies that the United States could have done something differently at certain moments to avert this? Mm -hmm. Or was this kind of, do you think, an inevitable outcome? You know, so the the, the general point is I, I lean sort of towards some aspect of inevitability without thinking this is a teleological end. Mm -hmm. um, like U.S.-Russia relations sort of in a general sense always comes to the idea that Every U.S. president who comes in thinks, I'm going to be the person who solves Russia. And, you know, from time to time, like, let's say in 2008 with the reset, you can have a president who can identify what are the actual policy areas where we agree. 
they do those things, and then where's the bigger cooperation? That doesn't come because Russia is, it's a big country. It has its own interests, and those interests are, in a general sense, um, to uh, make sure to the maximum extent possible transnational uh, issues like, or phenomena, globalization, democratization, all of these things which limit state power and state sovereignty to keep those at the borders. So when we think of inevitability, the things within Russia in which they describe where things came to essentially ahead, the number one thing is the Iraq war. The Iraq war, in terms of what was the lesson learned, that, you know, we tried to accommodate the United States, you know, during, like, right after 9-11 by allowing overflight, you know, the northern distribution network, like, across Russia. We allowed them to go into Central Asia because, you know, our interests coincided. Taliban, bad for everyone. Al-Qaeda, bad for everyone. Uh, that threatens, you know, Russian security as well. But from there to essentially being unable to stop the United States from going into Iraq, that indicated that we will give, they will take, but there will be no reciprocity. And if there's no reciprocity, how can we work with these people? And so from there, from sort of the Russian perspective again, the, uh, the movement towards making uh, Georgia and Ukraine on the path towards NATO membership and essentially making these, and you know, color revolutions, NATO membership, the expansion of all these um, Euro-Atlantic institutions. When these Euro-Atlantic institutions were going to areas of the former, let's say, Soviet external empire in Central Europe, um, they could understand, we conquered these countries once, they're now going to be on the other side. Sort of like how Italy used to change sides uh, in you know, the days of yore. But Georgia and Ukraine are internal empire. These are part of the Russian empire pre-Soviet. And so this is essentially what they observed. We help them after 9-11. They object to our policy interests regarding Iraq. And not only are they going to not heed our interests, but they'll take the things that we think are important to us. And so all of this in combination leads to President Putin's 2007 uh, Munich Security Conference speech, in which he basically lays out this case. People teach us about democracy, but they don't do it themselves. Unipolarity is one country, you know, running roughshod over the interests of others. And I, as the leader of Russia, and, you know, as part of, like, the non-unipolar world, I reject. So everything that we've seen after can already be observed in sort of these 2006, 2007, post-Iraq, post um essentially NATO membership uh, expansion plans. We should be clear, though, that it's not just NATO and the United States. It's also the European Union in the mix. So, sure. Um, the, so, uh, yeah. So I mean, you said your Atlantic institutions. and Yeah. Right. So the, NATO is definitely like the, um, the marquee headline. But part of what the, Euro the opposition to the European Union is they want... So the same thing with NATO is they wanted to get into the European Union, want to get into NATO in sort of like, you know, a very broad sense, but they didn't want to follow the rules set by NATO or the European Union. And they also didn't want to join in essentially the same procedure and status as, like, let's say, Poland, where they have to follow other rules and essentially become part of a bloc. You know, as, uh, as has been said, uh, great powers are not good joiners. And so that same idea of if Ukraine goes into you know, signs these free trade agreements, if Georgia signs these free trade agreements, you know, Moldova, so forth. What that means for Russia is that Russia's ability to, you know, create an autarkic economy, which was true in the 19th century, true in the, 20, in the 20th century, would not be true in the 21st. And so losing essentially these states, like, like Ukraine in particular, because Ukraine is sort of like the key to everything. Um, if they lose Ukraine... Well, that means that the Eurasian Economic Union, which is born out of this opposition to unipolarity, it's basically Russia with Kazakhstan and a bunch of very small economies. So the European Union is uh, the long-term threat. NATO is sort of like the, the, the much more exciting threat. Uh, but both of these things together indicate the same outcome. Our ability to keep international institutions globalization, democratization, essentially like 
just the transnational world and interdependence at bay and at our borders, we can literally, we can, or at least we can metaphorically see it being uh, restricted and restricted to our borders. And then, the, and then of course, like, you know, what is the problem with diffusion or the threat of a good example, particularly when it comes to Ukraine? Russians, you know, and, and I'm now sort of lovingly, categor- lovingly uh, exaggerating here, Russians look at Ukrainians at the same way maybe sophisticated New Yorkers look at people from Alabama. If basically these rural bumpkins can become a European country with a vibrant economy, you know, with democratic interaction and at peace with its neighbors, the idea that we as Russians who are orders of magnitude more sophisticated, the argument that we need sovereign democracy, the argument that it'll take decades or centuries for us to reach European levels, or that, you know, we cannot do it because we're unique and we're Russian. If Ukrainians who are so much like us can do it, how could we not? Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is like, that's a domestic argument, but about the foreign relations of uh, the country. So there's a real interest then uh, in keeping uh, countries in the near abroad more authoritarian and or more corrupt and or uh, in uh, worse economic shape. Uh, because those are the reference group for the Russians. Is that the argument? Yeah. So to an extent, like, what is the basis of of hierarchy in international relations and alliances? You want your alliance partners, and this, you know, of course, this can go about the debate about democratic peace and and what that means. But at the at the the long and the short of it is, you want your alliance partners to look like you to facilitate interaction. And this is basically like what Russia has. It would prefer its neighbors to have the same. So let's back up because we, I think this has done a really good job of setting the stage for some of the interests mm-hmm. at play. But we know at some point, um, and maybe more than once, uh, Russian activities with respect to the U.S. election shifted from let's just make life really difficult for Hillary Clinton to, hmm, this Trump guy, he looks interesting. Yeah. Uh, and that may have happened actually multiple times, right, depending on how, what the Russian assessment of Trump's uh, viability was as a candidate. So, so what happened exactly? Why did the Russians move to seeing Trump as an opportunity, not just as a, uh, as a person who could help them uh, make life difficult for the United States and for Hillary Clinton? So, I mean, because what to the extent that, that uh, Trump was talking about foreign policy on the campaign trail, all of the, posi- and, and so we could get into like, you know, what is Trump's connection to Russia ahead of time and so forth, but you know, we can leave that aside for a second. The issues that he was raising on the campaign trail, state sovereignty, America first, stop the meddling into other countries' affairs, the focus on bilateral economic and political relations, uh, skepticism about globalization itself, skepticism about the European Union through his um, championing of Brexit, um, skepticism about NATO. You know, we'll check the receipts before we come to the aid of Estonia. Uh, and particularly in terms of anti-ISIS as basically like the key thing. These are all foreign policy positions which are for the dream candidate of Russia right now. These are all the exact things that they've been talking about for, you know, the last several years. And so I think when he was actually elected, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And, you know, of course, like, who who voted for President Trump and, or, you know, candidate Trump in the election here? People who sensibly thought, you know, we need to be more isolationist and or more unilateralist. International institutions are binding us. International institutions are essentially not... Uh, designed or made in the American interest. That's where the overlap is. And, you know, we don't need to think about, you know, any grand conspiracy or sort of like any underheaded methods. The enthusiasm for Trump after he was elected was genuine in that if this guy can actually move on the uh, on the foreign policy pledges that he's made, and, you know, obviously they recognize, like, issues about NATO involve, like, you know, there, there's... There's a lot of physics there. I think, as I think, as you said, like in this Columbia talk, NATO has a lot of weight. But the decision about what to do in Syria, that's up to the president. And they thought, this is clearly the thing that we've been talking about. We need to destroy ISIS. 
And we, we as the Russians, need to essentially collaborate with the United States on anti-terrorism as the basis of great power cooperation. That was the enthusiasm. And basically, if um, if Trump takes his attention away from the outside world and focuses on internal issues plus anti-terrorism, like that's a good thing. Like that's clearly what they would want out of a uh, out of a, out, of, out of a U.S. president. And it's clear the difference with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was going to be status quo. Ukraine sanctions, NATO, you know, th- that there's nuances between the anti-Assad opposition. That's all the stuff that they didn't like. So, you know, the one thing that I sort of like want to be careful in saying is wanting Trump to win and trying to help him win didn't, you know, does not equal that they knew he was going to win. You know, it's it's like sort of like what is the definition of the costly lottery? Like from fear on and, you know, so forth. I mean, you go to war, you try to like, you know, win. But who knows what happens? And the who knows what happens happened. And that's ultimately like where they found themselves. And so from, you know, November 8 to January 20, this is where they're starting to, at the very beginning, like even in mid-November, uh, this is where uh, Dmitry Peskov, who's the press secretary of uh, President Putin. And so Peskov is really like the person who is, his job is to float these policy balloons. And he basically went with all these different things. Why don't we rethink Minsk? Why don't we rethink anti-ISIS? Why don't we rethink all these different things? And he's suggesting, and he was suggesting throughout November, December, all of these different sort of concrete policy proposals from the Russian side in an informal manner to essentially the American mass media to which to get to Trump uh, personally. And of course, what we've seen is Russia as an issue has constrained the ability of the president to actually move forward on all the things that he wanted. Yeah, we, uh, we've, we talked about this a bit at the round table, and I think that's, that's worth pursuing a bit because I think your sense, and this is pretty much everybody's sense, uh, yeah. was that, first of all, Trump's ability to take us offline towards Russia is pretty constrained right now, right? Because yeah. anything he does would be interpreted as evidence in favor of uh, collusion with Moscow prior to the election, right? So he, that he's yeah. fairly boxed in in his ability to try to get rid of the sanctions or to try to do more enduring cooperation, right? So that was sort mm-hmm. of the first theory argument. The second argument was that uh, overall... Well, I think we agreed that Trump can do a lot of damage to the U.S.-led order, for good or for ill, depending Mm -hmm. on your perspective, um, just by not showing up or saying stupid incendiary things or more broadly undermining the credibility of the United States in the long term uh, to follow through on the kind of bargains that undergird the system. That that nonetheless, um, his ability to actually radically overhaul things, maybe with the exception of, of Middle East interventions, is pretty limited, um, mm-hmm. that there might be, that the, the optimistic scenario, if you think these are all bad things, is that there's a lot of institutional constraints. Um, Congress uh, has a lot of players who are not, who are still sort of the old style Republicans uh, yeah. when it comes to uh, to NATO, et cetera, and a lot of Democrats who, uh, even if they were softer line, have gotten less soft line now. Um, and so our sense was that, that, I think what we talked about is that maybe with a few exceptions, there are a lot of ways in which the Russians could be very, very disappointed at the end of the day sure. with, with whatever return they might have gotten from their efforts. Um, is that still your sense? or? Yeah. Um, I'd say that the, the, the sort of buyer's remorse uh, that has been experienced right now is, one, finding out that sometimes candidates say things on the campaign trail that they find difficult to carry out while in office because of these countervailing pressures and institutions. They have found that, and what they're also realizing right now is that Trump is in fact, this is the third election in a row in which the American people have voted against um, intervention abroad. I would say both of Barack Obama's elections and Trump's election has been sort of this Iraq fatigue. So for Donald Trump essentially to openly increase interventionism in the Middle East, is limited. Uh, we've seen sort of in the news that they're increasing in Yemen, increasing in, around Mosul, Erbil, but this is stuff that's effectively still not very well discussed. 
and it's on the margins. But the big picture stuff, which Russia wanted, they're, they're clearly not getting. And the disappointment has already set in on that. Um, the other Although thing it, with, it must be said yeah. that there's some, I saw some reports this morning that the United States is finally officially backing away from the notion that Assad has to go. So and sure. that, that must be music to Moscow's ears, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think Nikki Haley was the one who sort of indicated that. Um, I, I think probably jo John Kerry probably outlined that, you know, uh, probably about a year ago. Uh, once we did the red line, once the red line was not respected, I, I, you know, from uh, Assad's use of chemical weapons and uh, Obama using that as a red line but not doing anything about it, that probably was the moment where we really recognized that Assad was going to be there for quite a while. Um, but that said, so shifting back to like Russia today, what, what America will do is there's a big difference between we're not going to seek the ouster of uh, Assad, we're going to take out ISIS. Taking out ISIS requires the Congress to, do, to say something, requires the Senate to say something, it requires some amount of debate. And that is clearly not a thing that seems politically feasible at the moment right now. The other side of where um, Russia has been also quite disappointed is, and this is not really about foreign policy, but really what gets that to where they thought America and Russia would have better relations. In terms of the America first, uh, you know, environmental policies and energy policies, uh, already we've had the removal of a lot of fracking restrictions, as well as essentially just the general encouragement of more energy exports from the United States. And, you know, so I also follow the energy markets as part of looking at sort of Russia's foreign economic policy. And the, the voices in the finance world in Russia and sort of around the energy markets generally have been nothing but bad news since Trump has been elected. Because what essentially was clear that if, if Clinton gets elected, you know, there's, climate change, fracking, shale, etc. That's on one side. If Trump gets elected, we're going to see a major increase of U.S. energy exports. And Russia, um, you know, to this day, and we can talk about sort of like what, what is the source of dissatisfaction within Russia on a popular level. The dissatisfaction within Russia right now is that there just isn't enough money. Part of it is the collapse in energy prices which have reduced the price of, obviously reduced the price of oil, so there's less oil money coming in, less money to redistribute, which has unveiled that over the past 17 years, there's been no effective diversification. And that Russia, in the bigger, in the general sense of it, is richer than it was in 2000 when Putin came in, but it's not any different. And that's essentially what uh, Russia has to deal with. Putin is, uh, so, basically at this point, Trump is not doing as much as they thought on sort of Middle East interventions because they need the United States to come in and basically save the day in terms of military capabilities and that he is continuing. And so he's also going with these policies which are crushing their budget. So actually, I, I want to pick up on something you said. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff we could talk about here, right, including, yeah. uh, you know, Russia's dependency on, on energy exports yeah. and the distorting effect that's had on their political economy, not just under Putin, but all the way back to the, the Soviet era, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, as we know, the real kind of, uh, a lot of the expansion of activities under uh, Perestroika and uh, Glasnost uh, had something to do with the collapse in oil prices, right? And there right. are people who even argue that, you know, the Soviet Union would have held together had it not been for the bottoming out of oil prices in the late 80s, early 90s. Sure. Um, but I, I actually want to come back to this, this point you just said in passing about, about Syria. So it sounds like your reading is that the Russians, uh, Russian military capabilities are, and logistical capabilities are pretty overextended in Syria, mm. right? Is that your sense that essentially, I, I mean, mm. there have been reports about deploying much more heavier capabilities there, but is mm -hmm. your sense that, you know, and, and if you read the news, you know, there are some counterattacks, but it looks like, you know, the the Assad regime and Russia have got their enemies, mm. you know, at least if not on the run, at least, you know, they've knocked them back a bit. Sure. But your sense is that, that, the, that they really do need U.S. intervention uh, to, mm. to get them out of this? So what we've seen in terms of uh, 
the Russian military capabilities, particularly when it comes to coordination with the Syrians, is that the Russians can come in, uh, so like they can retake Palmyra, for example. And um, perhaps people who are following this remember when the Russian army had uh, the symphony come in and play the uh, play a concert where the ISIS had just been and, and done all those brutal acts. So they can take Palmyra, and, uh, and the idea is, you know, sort of like reminiscent of maybe like Vietnam era. The, the external in- intervener comes in, they can take the territory, and then the locals are supposed to hold it. Well, part two of that, that's what falls out. Uh, and so, in fact, ISIS was retaken by ISIS from the Syrian army, which then obliged the Russian army to go back in and then retake Palmyra. So what we're seeing right now, before Russians really commit to the open-ended um, occupation that they've been tr- really desperately trying to avoid, is exactly this. Um, they can take territory, they can hold it to some extent, but when it comes to the, the important part, which is extending the reach of the Syrian government, that's where they're falling short. And, you know, you go to war with the alliance partner that you have, not the alliance partner that you want. And this is where they wanted the United States to come in. So that if the United States intervenes in a significant way, well, that alleviates the burden on the Syrian army to hold these uh, hold these areas. And that's essentially what we, that's where we are, like, right now. But that gets at how complicated this all is, because if you look at um, the United States alliance partners... Mm -hmm. in the Middle East uh, and its anti-ISIS partners. These tend to be uh, uh, Sunni uh, Arab monarchies, right? Yeah. Uh, Or the the predominantly Shia Iraqi army, right? Yeah. Uh, But they also happen to be the Kurds, right, Mm -hmm. who have their own objectives, you know, for what it means to hold territory in Syria. And so you've got this enormously complex complex set of relationships um, from the perspective of the Russians getting what they want, right? And part of the real complication yeah. here is that, uh, with the exception of the Iraqis, most of these allies, right, are allies that are implacably, implacably opposed to the Iran-Syria-Russia axis, sure. right? So how does this all play out for Russians when they think about a U.S. activity? You, know, you say, well, it's great because the U.S. might come in and, you know, really kind of help us in Syria by getting rid of ISIS. On the other hand, the you know, and, and that would be great. We like that in Trump. But Trump also comes in uh, determined to push back at Iran. The only allies who are really happy about things about mm-hmm. with Trump are, in fact, some of America's Arab allies. So uh, how does this all kind of play out if you're sitting in Moscow and thinking about these kinds of contingencies? Or is it just right now the key task is not letting Syria mm-hmm. become another Vietnam or another Iraq, so to speak, yeah. uh, for sure. the Russians? Uh, the so when so when my Russians colleagues discuss like and so I've had these conversations you know let's enumerate what are the foreign policy interests here the, the big essentially the the minor issue is make sure Assad doesn't fall make sure Assad doesn't fall essentially has these knock on effects of proving the following things one that unlike the United States Russia will support its allies at the time of need and usually like in Moscow for having this conversation. We talk about Assad, we're talking about Mubarak. America abandoned Hosni Mubarak at his greatest moment of need. Uh, it attacked uh, Gaddafi, really, at his greatest moment of need. So by saving Assad, we demonstrate something about ourselves. And so, like, b- before I continue further, just to really make this explicit, the Russian intervention in Syria, th- the aspects about Syria and the Middle East are secondary to the big goal, make Russia a great power. And so what do great powers do? Make they Russia great us. again. Make Russia great again. Сделаем Америку великой снова, as it goes. Um, but what they, what they want to do is great powers help their alliance partners, Assad. Great powers can project power into a region not their own. That Russia is in the Middle East in and of itself is a great victory. And finally, they just want to be just to have a seat at the table. By inviting, you know, the Syrians plus the opposition to Astana, you know, one of the other alliance partners, well, you know, not only can we project power, but we can provide the venue for peace. And so in terms of the big things, all of this is in the basket of making Russia great again. 
when it comes to the actual th- you know situation on the ground, they recognize that essentially by going all in on Assad, which in effect helps Iran, that they have taken sides in essentially the greater Middle East uh, struggle for power, and that America and its allies are basically the entire Sunni world. And so the thread that they're trying to figure out, and I don't know that they have figured out, but what they're trying to do is essentially because the Muslim population within Russia itself is totally Sunni. They are essentially conducting an anti-Sunni war. There is not the level of radicalization within uh, Russia itself as there is outside, but of course one of the fears that they have is the radicalization of Sunnis in a place like Syria could indicate that people go from Central Asia or Southern Russia to these areas, uh, learn how to fight a war, and then come back to destabilize. So in terms of what they're trying to do, basically just have a seat at the table. Continue projecting power and not lose, however not losing is defined, and make sure that Assad is there until they can effectively sell him for something better. And if, let's say, a U.S. president came in, Trump or somebody else, and said uh, to President Putin, if you give up Assad and Syria and basically cede the Middle East to the United States, and we'll give you a security treaty about uh, Europe in which, you know, we end, like, NATO's security monopoly on the continent, Assad would be, um, he would be living in the suburbs of Moscow, ruining the day that he trusted the Russians in minutes. And that, because essentially what we would get at that point is, rather than being involved in the thicket of Middle East politics, which is so complicated, that they can essentially create the foreign policy issue, Russian presence in the Middle East, and then effectively use that as a policy concession on Ukraine, which is probably a much more likely thing. Um, Policy concession on Ukraine and European security, which is far greater interest to them than anything in the Middle East. Well, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting argument because you know a lot of the discourse uh, among hardliners in the United States about mm-hmm. Ukraine and Syria has been well, it was Obama weakness in Ukraine that led to the intervention in Syria, right? That's been the standard story. Right. If only Obama had uh, taken mm-hmm. much more forthright uh, action, given lethal aid sooner, um, uh, given lethal aid at all, um, uh, gone in uh, with you know. Overflow, you know, sent the 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 F-22s to overfly Ukraine. Done whatever, really read yeah. read the Riot Act to Russia. Then Russia never would have been emboldened to go into Syria. Uh, you know, I have friends who make that argument, but it sounds sure. to me like what you're saying is kind of the opposite, right? That um, mm-hmm. it was in fact, um, if Syria isn't part of bargaining chip for for cent- Eastern and Central Eurasian security arrangements, yes. that uh, a harder line would have in fact simply led the Russians to be more aggressive in terms of trying to develop bargaining chips against the United States. For sure, because they're, I mean, the Russian point of all of this is not to make sure Bashar al-Assad is, you know, happy, healthy, and the ruler of Syria. It's to make sure that Vladimir Putin is happy, healthy, and the ruler of Russia. And if, and and so, like, this is the thing about Russia having sort of you know, not just like a very strong leader, but elite consensus, is the ability to be flexible on foreign policies. And so when we think about what could the United States have done differently, um, it really, in terms of like how the Russians, like how they view what U.S. policy is today, is it goes back to the Georgia war and the reset. Uh, And and essentially, how do those two things explain the non-action of the United States regarding Crimea? So the Russians were shocked shocked, uh, and not like Casablanca, but actually shocked, that um, that essentially the 2008 Georgia war, they recognized that directly thereafter, America's probably not going to like, you know, bomb Rostov or Krasnodar, you know, the southern Russian city, in order to expel uh, the Russian army from Abkhazia, South Ossetia. The, the war is what it is, but that the United States, but that a U.S. ally who's so pro-America could essentially lose this war, suffer the consequences, and that the consequences to the Russia would be effectively nil at the time of George W. Bush in his in his sort of last months in office. That was a big surprise. So then, when 
so and for them they're able to explain themselves like in terms of sort of like updating their priors you know america supports its allies well they didn't support the ally because it's in the middle of a presidential election and essentially we had this war at a moment when america was uniquely unable to do anything okay we have that then we have the reset okay the reset is a good thing because we identify not only all these like discrete policy areas in which we can cooperate we can at least try to remake our relationship that's fine so in essence when we get to uh you know the euromaidan and crimea we have already an example the United- an american ally is attacked america does nothing and responds with essentially a- a- accommodation or sort of negotiation etc i was i was in ukraine or was, uh, sorry i was in russia when the euromaidan happened and like crimea was taken and i can tell you uh the very first the very first reactions were holy crap what are we going to do america is going to read us the riot act whatever that means we're going to get it and it didn't happen and when it didn't happen that's essentially when the uh you know reunification referendum annexation uh that's when that happened and the president uh, putin then addresses essentially the joint ho- joint houses of parliament it is like if you or any of like the 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 listener or the watchers or the viewers have ever been in a city that wins like a major sports championship it's that level of <laughs> i just remember i will never forget this the, till the day that i die is uh, like on the moscow metro the the social norm is don't talk don't smile just like get to point b people are openly laughing hugging there's these two um these two middle-aged women just getting absolutely ripped on sort of this cheap champagne and it felt like this huge victory we took crimea and nothing happened that was the genius of president putin and you know when we think about sort of like the upcoming elections in term like in russia itself the last presidential election in 2012 there are no real or viable uh, opponents so all the campaign commercials were about remember the 90s remember the bedlam i came in i brought stability i brought everything that's good they have since for the 2018 election moved the date of the election to about 2 days away from the anniversary of the speech that felt like you know winning the world cup or winning the you know the super bowl or something so what would have so that actually cuts against um the way that i interpreted your earlier comment Mm-hmm. it suggests that in fact russia may have been involved i mean it's sort of it sounds very complicated right on the one hand it, it russia clearly the sanctions are crippling for russia mm-hmm. and very and probably right now the clear the clearest and present danger to the survival of the regime right yeah. um so that's had a real effect and it sounds like some of the activity in syria is then a bargaining chip to to yeah. settle have some sort of final settlement that preserves russian interests in gets them out of this regime uh in Eurasia in western Eurasia. Uh but it also sounds like from what you're saying that actually mm-hmm. a much harder line US response might have averted uh the the Syrian intervention. Uh, you know so the Russian thinking on essentially what the United States is going to do they're they're updating in 2014 relative to what happened 2008-2009. So because obviously in a sense like when Obama comes in the Georgia war was 6 months previous so what's he going to do then So if I think yeah so in that sense if there is a you know much more uh, aggressive US response regarding Crimea Crimea and Ukraine are so important to Russia it's really hard to sort of like overstate this they would have definitely I mean my sense of my colleagues at the time is that they would have gone to war over Ukraine and Crimea for all the reasons be, uh, that I've sort of like uh, mentioned if they lose Ukraine and Ukraine becomes part of the west the ability of Russia to be a regional power to essentially make themselves as one of the world's great powers like you know BRICS plus Germany and the United States that's off the table for a generation maybe for you know a century so it's that level of seriousness that they were going to escalate no matter what. So if there was a more uh durable US response 
in 2014 regarding Crimea, Ukraine, I definitely think we would have gone to war. I, I'm very that confident that we would have gone to war. And then sort of like Syria would have just been relatively unimportant right. because we're going to war over Ukraine. So it's not just, I mean, it's important to stress here that it's not just a matter of kind of rational interests, right? It's yeah. not just an, because Ukraine's status, you mentioned this earlier, but, you know, Ukraine is not, it's, it's not Kazakhstan, right? It's not Tajikistan. Uh, it's not Poland, right? And it's, it's not even Georgia or Azerbaijan, right? You, the, you, you know, I remember back when I was uh, first working in the Russia office, you know, the, the, you know Putin, Medvedev, there were these speeches that where the Russians were suggesting that Ukraine wasn't a real country, right? Yeah. Ukrainians were just little sure. Russians. Uh, and in fact, that that's very deeply embedded in Russian nationalist ideology, right? The, the, the interpretation of the Treaty of Pereyaslav as this grand union between mm -hmm. uh, two related Slavic peoples speaking essentially the same language, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, that, that Russians, I mean, is that right that Russians don't even really view Ukraine as, as a legitimate country, more or less, that it's really just part of Russia? Uh, and so there are sort of special stakes there. Yeah, so at, so at the edge of nationalist ideology, mm -hmm. um, you, you hear uh, Ukraine, so like Ukraina, mm -hmm. like in the, in the Russian language, it means at the edge. And Ukraine is often called uh, Mala Russia, little Russia. Mm -hmm. So you definitely hear this. And so, you know, this is one of those like issues in which like, like where does elite consensus come from? Nationalists look at the idea of Ukraine becoming part of like Europe itself as just beyond the pale of what is acceptable because that would be, you know, several hundred years of effectively like England and Scotland being part of the UK or something. To rip that apart would just be unfathomable. You also have like President Putin in terms of rational interest, you know, in terms of trying to build you know, a 21st century of 19th century great power politics, well, great powers need, you know, an array of alliance partners, like these subordinate states. Ukraine is the key one, because not only is it the biggest post-Soviet country besides Russia itself, but it is the bridge with which to essentially deal with Europe itself. If Europe has, to, if Russia has to deal with Europe as a united bloc, including, uh, including uh, Ukraine, then Russia's capabilities on a bilateral basis are very much reduced. And sort of, and Ukraine is, especially the eastern part of Ukraine, is still part of the, you know, Russian imperial era military industrial complex, as well as like the, just the general so pre-Soviet, Soviet, and post-Soviet industry. So in terms of, you know, for the Russian business community, which needs an entryway into Europe, the nationalists who need Ukraine to be part of Russia in sort of like a mystical sense, as well as President Putin thinking about Ukraine as the key towards international relevance. You know, just pick, pick your favorite poison. Like, there's, there's something in it for everyone in which Ukraine is more important than effectively all these other issues because it basically determines nationalism, the economic, economic policy of the country, as well as the foreign policy of the country. So we're running out of time, but I want to make sure that we talk about something that you mentioned at the outset, which is yeah. the wave of protests that just hit Russia. For sure. Um, because this was, I think, uh, somewhat surprising, uh, both in the sort of the, the, the scale, right? They were all over the yeah. country, right, from the sure. Far East to the Far West. Um, and also because, um, you know, the thinking had been that the Russians had gotten much better at, Moscow had gotten much better at shutting down uh, the ability of people to coordinate these kinds of these kinds of protest activity, particularly after the, the previous round. But so what's going on? Explain this to us. So I think the the big picture here is obviously they happened. They were huge. They were across the country. They were there was no external resources to organize them. It was just online. And, and what they did is obviously they didn't attack President Putin directly, but they found the next best thing, the Prime Minister uh, Medvedev. Um, and so even in the name of the video itself, which essentially caused the uproar, um, on vam ni dimon. So in the sense, so it's, it's worth a sort of translating for a second. Um, so like your name, your full name is like Daniel, 
and like an acceptable nickname is Dan. Mm-hmm. But if I called you Danny, it's essentially to knock you down a peg, and it's a bit disrespectful. And so Dimon, he's not he's not little Dima to you. And so what they did is actually like pretty probably one of the most interesting things of investigative journalism that I've ever seen, which taps into the societal dissatisfaction at large. There was a anonymous international one of these hacking groups. Um, they basically hacked a bunch of government, uh, Russian government emails. Nothing interesting in and of itself, but they found basically this one email address that had all of these different uh, clothing and shoe orders, and as well as like these orders for like gadgets. And of course, President or Prime Minister Medvedev is well known for his love of gadgetry. So what they did is they actually looked at the orders for these shoes, like his like sneakers, and then they went to his Instagram feed, and they found that all of these shirts and shoes, which are highly you know these specific ones, which were delivered to somewhere in Moscow, were then showing up sometime later in these Instagram pictures. So then they're like, well, where does Medvedev go on vacation? So then they did through geolocating, they found all the places in his Instagram feed. Well, what are these places? These are places that are obviously in Russia, but they're not on maps. So they figured out where these places are using essentially, you know, the the outline of a mountain, the street lamps, all these really specific details to show that he was in these specific places at these specific times. Then they went into the business records and they basically uncovered that President, so Prime Minister Medvedev, for the last number of years, has assembled giant houses outside of Moscow, giant houses, a uh, huge pre-revolutionary mansion in Saint Petersburg, these uh, vineyards in southern Russia as well as in uh, Tuscany, yachts, essentially all the things that a super rich guy would have. So they basically present this story, but the story that they present isn't just you know, government official has expensive things. They make a social justice claim at the same time. When things were good, we all, you know, from the time of, like, Gogol and Saltykov Shedrin, um, people know that Russian bureaucrats are corrupt. That's not the surprise here. But what they make uh, as a claim, and this is what brought people onto the streets, when oil prices were good, you know, between us friends, you know, what's a what's a, you know, $85 million mansion? No, not too much. But once we have had essentially the economic contraction that we've had, it shows that the people at the very top are not sharing in the sacrifice. They don't have $55 million mansions. They're going for the full 85. And so, and this happens at the same week that the Russian parliament passed a law um, that allows people who are Russian citizens the tax residents of foreign countries and are on the sanctions list to not have to pay taxes. Which is just like, you know, you think of a giveaway, as well as all the people on the sanctions list who have been, um, who have had their property, you know, their real estate property as well as movable property uh, confiscated by European authorities because of sanctions, they've been uh, reimbursed by the Russian Treasury. So, like, at this level, this is the the underlying thing of what the what the dissatisfaction is we are suffering because you know the fall in the price of the oil means obviously oil prices are going down there are fewer dollars chasing our rubles so the price of our ruble is less and so because we haven't diversified our country we're still relying on imports imports are more expensive that cuts into people's disposable income particularly at the lower levels of, of income and wealth at the same time we have these sanctions related to Ukraine, why are we fighting the Ukrainians? These are our, if, if not our best friends, our brothers, our cousins, why are we fighting these people and calling them Nazis and fascists? And so you then have Navalny putting together a really like well done video that shows why are we supporting these policies, one, and in terms of everyone else doing worse, they seem to be doing, if not as well as before, but even better. You with luxury that is, and when I saw this video, I was like, wow, like you can't even imagine maybe like, you know, this is like the way Bill Gates lives or like Jeff Bezos, like really proper wealth. And that's essentially what pe- brought people onto the streets. 
there's a social justice component plus an upcoming election. And Navalny is very open. He says, in the Russia of tomorrow, the Russia in which I am president, we will actually take this money and we'll redistribute it from, you know, this very small, narrow elite to the people in general. And with the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, the clear historical parallels are there. The Russian parliament today is, in fact, far less ideologically diverse and with zero effective opposition, it was more open and competitive in the years leading up to the revolution. And so you have all of these negative aspects from before that sort of the social justice issues of those days. The Russian government is talking about, you know, reintegrating whites into sort of like historical memory, talking about the need for stability. And Navalny is coming up with these, with a very modern version of a red argument that essentially the problem with these people is not just that they're leading unfair, that the society is unfair, but that they're peculiarly profiting from it. And for those two reasons, we need to get rid of them and we need to fix the system. And so when you put it all together, people won't change. The upcoming election is going to be the first election in which there's a full generation of voters who were born after Vladimir Putin first came to power. And so, like, the, the effectiveness of anti-1990s, anti-America, it just doesn't reach uh, as well as it did, and it certainly doesn't reach, like, a full generation of voters. So I think that's a good place to end. Everything okay. old is new again. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> um, whether in Russia or in the United States. Um, thank you so much for coming on. No, thanks for having me on. Right. And uh, if anyone wants to get in touch, you know, please feel free. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.